evening to you. Welcome to the Neil Oliver Show with me, Bev Turner, tonight while Neil's on his holidays. We are, of course, on TV, radio and online. Now, I'm sorry about the red and the red. I didn't get the memo. If I look like a disembodied head, I'm ever so sorry. Uh, tonight, though, it's been a terrifying week, if you believe, in free speech. One man's charges for social media posts included the reference to his anti-establishment rhetoric. I'm not joking. We're going to be asking a leading barrister what all of this might mean. The boxer at the centre of the Olympic gender controversy is suing Elon Musk and J.K. Rowling for aggravated cyber harassment. What chance does Emain Khalif have of winning that? And it's now called M-Pox, not Monkeypox, presumably because we didn't take it seriously enough when they tried that last year. The World Health Organization has declared M-Pox a major global emergency and the first cases have now been found in Europe. I'll be asking an expert if it's just another infection with a powerful marketing campaign. And finally, we're going to be catching up with the Australian Olympic breakdancing story, which is still spinning across the world. All of that and more coming up. But first, an update on the latest news. So over the last couple of weeks since the slaughter of three little girls at a Southport dance class, Great Britain has experienced a dizzying transformation into a frightened society in which the spoken or written word can land an otherwise blameless person in prison. Powerful dissident voices, predominantly on the political right, have grown noticeably quiet on Twitter and Facebook. Frightened by headlines of ordinary people being banged up for a hasty tweet or an expression of anger online. And it is this silencing which is precisely what Starmer and his Blairite acolytes want. Of course, free speech is complex and the law has normally wrapped itself around the issue largely satisfactorily. Until now. The example often used is whether you should be allowed to shout a fire in a crowded room. Some say no. I say yes, because people aren't stupid and they will use their other senses and awareness of heat or smoke to decide if they are in danger. But underpinning so much of the rhetoric of the last two weeks is the idea that British people are stupid and cannot be trusted to type words online in case they make other people do stupid things. Labour MP Jess Phillips largely kicked this off this week when uh, a gathering of Muslim men amassed in her Birmingham constituency and she tweeted... All day, rumours have been spread that a far-right group were coming and it was done entirely to get Muslim people out on the street. It is misinformation being spread to create trouble. Now, these local louts eventually ragged their boy racer cars and their Palestinian flags around a roundabout, caused frightened pub goers to barricade the doors and eventually beat up a customer in the pub car park. Phillips could have tweeted, take responsibility for your own actions, regardless of whether you feel goaded online. Don't come out looking for trouble. But that isn't fashionable anymore. Gone are the days of telling people to take control of their own lives. We're now under a Labour government where you can look for the state to pay for your life and blame someone else when you inexplicably find yourself in a riot. Prince Harry waded in and blamed the internet for the post-Southport riot. What happens online within a matter of minutes transfers to the streets, he said. People are acting on information that isn't true. As though people were sat at home watching TV with a cuppa until they are gripped like a zombie by a tweet and decide to smash in the window at Greg's. It is patronising nonsense. And Harry's idea that this is because information isn't true contains the assumption that if controversial facts about an aggressor or a situation are true, that would make rioting somehow OK. It is bonkers. We need to stop blaming everything on social media. It is lazy, it is thick, and it's leading us towards accepting a closed society in which the narrative is dictated entirely by the state in collaboration with a compliant media. And the individual, you and me, are reduced to a passive, silent, stupid object who can't be trusted to think properly. Social media terrifies politicians and newspaper editors because it gives us, the little people, the ability to exchange information. In a world where 5 billion people use social media every day, some of it will be inaccurate. Just like some things in newspapers have been inaccurate for decades. But democracies rely on the ability to exchange opinions and information. We need to tell our conflicting stories so that we continue to evolve into the 21st century rather than retreat into a weak, 
ineffectual tyranny of silence. So joining me now is Francis Hall, public law barrister. Uh, Francis, uh, good to see you. Um, I've just been talking about how I personally, I find it quite terrifying the last couple of weeks and the, uh, the very firm fist with which Keir Starmer has been uh, stamping out. It almost feels like quite personal to him um, in his role of former uh, director of public prosecutions. He seems to be very much involved in these cases to stamp out dissent, particularly on the right. H how has it appeared to you from your legal perspective? Well, I think there are two elements, Beth, and, and uh, afternoon, it's good to see you. Um, the first is the riots, the actual riots themselves, um, punishing those who have rioted and uh, and uh, use the word uh, in a non-legal sense necessarily, I mean, public disorder in general terms, and also, which is, I think, connected to this, the social media, um, which was directly encouraging riots. For example, mm. tweets saying, get out on the streets, boys, and burn down the hotel. Mm. Those will always be punished severely and quickly if people plead guilty, as those who've pun been punished have done. Um, that's not new. Uh, it goes back to as long as the, the, the courts have been operating, and it is necessary to, so, uh, to have a very quick uh, reaction that stops um, public disorder. It happened in 2011, and it's happened mm. now, and it happened as time to the past. That's one thing. Uh, questions will and can and should be raised about the proportionality and the extent of the sentences in due course. Um, I, I, I'm not going to comment on those in detail, but, uh, but, but that's, that's all I'm here to do. But the, the other concerning element has been the use of the Public um, Safety Act and the, as you say, the messaging by the government and also um, the the, the um, suggestion by the government which they knew would be picked up um, by the media about intelligence what might be intelligence or might not be but we have absolutely no way of knowing for example saying there are going to be a hundred riots on the streets tomorrow mm. um, I'm skeptical and I say that having spoken to a number of people who might know about this I can't say more than that but I'm very skeptical about the truth of that um, and I know that this comes from a go government machine, and I say government machine because, of course, it predates the new government, mm. a government machine that has experience in the last few years, as we both know, and many others, of nudging people, of setting out messages that are not necessarily true um, or, or certainly bending the truth in the way that they want to do so to manage people's behaviour. So just to explain, because people may not know what you're referencing there. So this was the Telegram group. So Telegram is another social media app where people can exchange information. And on that Telegram group appeared a suggestion that on the Wednesday night of last week, there were going to be 100 organised riots. And that was then uh, used as the catalyst for all of that build-up of tension on that particular day, there's going to be 100 rights, going to be 100 rights. As it turned out, there wasn't. I, for one, didn't think there was going to be at all. I don't think there are that many people who are sat at home who want to go out and, and smash in police windows with a yeah. piece of 4 by 2 yeah. I just wasn't reading the, the mood of the nation like that. Um, so is your suggestion, Francis, therefore, that there could have been, there could be, because we know that the organisation exists, the disinformation government unit, that they might have been some tinkering behind the scenes to provoke public discord? Well, it's very difficult. It's impossible. The problem is it's impossible to know. Uh, and we can't know. We won't know for some time. Uh, but we should do. Um, and obviously, there's good reason for government departments, some government departments, to be clouded in secrecy. And um, we don't know, for example, the number of terrorist attacks that MI5 foiled. And there's good reason for that. Um, but is there a good reason for um, there to be privacy and absolute government privacy about communications on telegram that may or may not have been true mm. or the, the government no i don't think so so i think in due course we we will we should find out about that and then we'll be in a better position to comment but it did seem to me um and uh, as i say i, I can mm. say no more than it seemed surprising that this message was put out and yeah. was picked 
so many media organisations. Uh, and and, uh, and I understand, if I recall the chronology correctly, I'll be correct if I'm wrong, but I understand that was the day before there were lots of anti-riots. And some of That's those right. anti-riots were, most, were mostly, they were in good order, but there were there was some public disorder on some of those mm. as well. Mm. Um, so it, it, yes, as, as you say, it, it does pit, fit with a, a, a sort of government narrative. Um, at the same time, I compl- as I said at the outset, I absolutely accept that the, the authorities need to clamp down on public disorder very hard and very fast um, to avoid it spreading, uh, as it did in 2011. And it did, this didn't spread as much as it did in 2011. The, the, and 2011 the, 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 the Crown Prosecution Service, Francis, have been... Um, it's no exaggeration to say bragging on X, formerly Twitter, br- genuinely bragging about the number of people who have been arrested in the aftermath of the disruption that we saw in the last couple of weeks. That, that feels unprecedented to me. And that feels like a very strong message being sent out to the country, which is just um, be careful what you say on social media. And maybe there is some logic, a little logic to that. Be careful what you say on social media because... Look at this example of this young lad. I mean, we've had, you know, this idea of, of there was a Lincolnshire man, as I say, in, who was charged under um, information against the state. I think, you know, um, anti-establishment yeah. rhetoric. That was the phrase, forgive me. Anti-establishment rhetoric. That's surely unprecedented in this country. I don't know about that, whether it's unprecedented or not. But what I what I will say firstly is that it is not unprecedented, but it is quite new for the CPS to have a major um, media presence and to be making statements. What I saw also, uh, and I was concerned about, was the Attorney General um, congratulating himself effectively on social media using the official AG web, um, Twitter website saying, I have approved the charging of individuals who have pleaded guilty. So... To, to be clear, he wasn't th- he wasn't putting in jeopardy their fairness of the fairness of their trial, but it, it seems totally inappropriate to me, and and if not unprecedented, unprecedented until recent times for law officers to boast about what they are doing for public disorder. That is for the Home Secretary. It's perfectly acceptable for the Home Secretary and the Home Office ministers mm-hmm. to give rhetoric about being tough on law and order. That's what they're there for. They are political, but the law officers are not, and the CPS are not, and they should not be. And, I, and the, another part of this is the police. I, I personally, I understand why the, the um, police need to communicate, but I personally would be very happy if much of their communications of, of the police ended immediately, um, because a lot of it is simply, as you say, bragging about their successful scalps. So, yes, OK, a police um, Twitter presence is extremely important to say we've got an, um, a, an unknown um, perpetrator. So we're looking for somebody. We're looking for fine. Of course, that's important. But a lot of what the chief constables do and what they authorise is totally wrong in my in my view. So that's one element. But that does absolutely feed into this government message and this managed message of a, um, a, a, a of a particular response that is fine from the Home Secretary, fine, absolutely no problem. And for the Prime Minister, that's what they're there, they're politicians. Mm. Um, but they, what they shouldn't be doing is using neutral agencies to, to spread this message. And, and I don't also do not think it's appropriate for the CPS to be saying, if you do X and Y, you will get Z. That's That, again, is for the Home Secretary to say, but the, the CPS are a neutral, um, disinterested, in the correct meaning of the word, public prosecutor. They don't have mm. an interest in being convicted. Um, they are putting forward... I, I, I used to prosecute I did, when I did crime, and I was a Minister of Justice, and inculcated in the bar is this, is this sense, with a small m. You have a duty to put forward the case in a neutral, fair-winded way. You are not aiming for a conviction... You're yeah. aiming to put ensure that the jury or the magistrates are in a position to do it. Sending out these messages, even if it is after pleas of guilty and even if it is after convictions, I don't think sends out the right message. And I think it's wholly wrong for these neutral public agencies to do that. Because it can only be about weaponising fear against the British public. Uh, Francis Hall, uh, good to see you as always. Thank you so much Thank for you your pleasure. insight.